Welcome to Gethsemane Baptist Temple, the voice of Calvary. Located in Star, South Carolina, we are a lively, old-time, Bible-believing, camp-meeting-style church where the shout has not died out. Join us now as our pastor, Sam Duncan, brings this week's message. For me, carry the cross all the way, my sin to atone. Then they placed him on a cross. Great was the pain and the loss. He suffered it all because he loved me. Because he loved me, he, my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. No greater love. But on that third and glorious day, God came and he rolled that stone away. He rose from the dead because he loved me. Because he loved me, me my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. No greater love by mortal man. you turn with me this morning to the book of Matthew chapter 25. We'll look into the word of God this morning. Matthew chapter 25. We'll do a little skip reading and we'll get started this morning. I'll give you a moment to find your place. Matthew chapter 25. If you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, you know these will be the actual spoken words of Jesus. Oh, the Bible is the word of God. But these verses are his actual words. And I want you to notice something. Uh, Matthew 25, we'll begin reading in verse 14 where the Bible says this. Here's what Jesus said. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. 
drop down to verse 19. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto uh, uh, me two talents. Behold, I've gained two talents, other, uh, two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good uh, and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of of the Lord. I want you to look this way just a minute. One man, I stood before the Lord before he took his journey and he gave that man five talents. Another fellow came along, he gave him two talents. And another fellow, he didn't give but one. But the sir, uh, the master goes away. Well, I guess you've already figured who the master is. And after a long absence, uh, the master returned. I got news for you. He's been gone about 2,000 years, but he's coming back. When he came back, he came to the man that had five talents. And, uh, Brother Greg, he said, well done, you good and faithful servant. Come on with me and enter the joy of the Lord. But what is surprising, the man that only had two talents, Jesus gave him the same encouragement, the same commendation, that he gave the man with five. He looked at the man with the two talents. He said, hey, you come on too. You've been faithful with your two talents, so enter on into the joy of the Lord. Hey, folks, it doesn't matter what your level of ability is. You just take what God has given you, use it for his glory, and God will bless you. I'm going to tell you right up front, the greatest stability is not being able to dissect the Bible and give it where people understand it. The greatest stability, and they just did a great job with this song, but the greatest stability is not hitting every note perfectly. The greatest stability is availability. You got to make available to the Lord whatever your abilities are. So, so many people think, well, I don't have great ability, so I can't serve the Lord. We want to debunk that theory today. Now, I'm going to preach on serve God. Well, whatever you got. Let's pray. Ask God's blessing. Austin, bump my monitor a tiny bit. Our Father God, we thank you today for the privilege of being in the house of God. I just pray, God, that we'll leave out of here today and every one of us will be more determined than ever to serve you. Let us realize, God, that it's not about perfection. It's not about a great and wondrous ability, but it's taking whatever that it is that we do have and making it available to you. And God, that you'll bless us for doing so. I pray you'll bless this message and every point that goes along with it. God, give us some help this day. We pray it. We ask it. We plead it now. 
now in the strong and mighty and matchless name of the Lord Jesus that we humbly pray. And all God's people this morning made the devil mad by saying what? Say it one more time. Amen. Let me begin this morning by saying uh, uh, down through the years uh, of pastoring uh, a church uh, or churches uh, and preaching uh, in a number of churches, uh, I have found out that not all actors uh, are in Hollywood. Somebody give me an amen. I found out, boy, there's more, a lot of folks in the church, uh, their name ought to be Oscar. I mean, some of them uh, will put on uh, a royal show. Uh, somebody put an amen uh, right there. And I found out that some people are masters of uh, of excuses and let me tell you the main excuse that people have for not serving God hey let me stop right here and say they try to spiritualize their laziness a lot of them are too lazy to serve God but I've never had anybody say preacher I'd serve God but I'm just too lazy I've never had anybody say that. But let me tell you how they will spiritualize their laziness. They'll say, oh, God is so worthy, and he is. And God should have the absolute best of everything, but I, I ain't got it. I, I don't have much to give God. So, preacher, y'all need to find somebody else called, pardon my English, it ain't me. You know what? If you're the one that thinks today that you don't have a whole lot of ability, you're the very one that God is looking for. He's not looking for somebody that thinks he's doing God a great favors. Let me tell you, I, I'll be the first to admit to you today, I ought to be in hell barefooted right now. I didn't have any ability. I didn't have any good in me. But thank God when you give God whatever little bit you have, uh, the Holy Ghost of God will touch it and anoint it and God will use it and you can begin to do some things for God that should have never done. Uh, otherwise, somebody put an amen. Let me say, God is not going to compare me to Billy Graham. God's not going to compare me to Oliver Green. God's not going to compare me to Maze Jackson. God has given me ability and he's only going to compare what I do to what my ability was. Let me tell you, as I said, they just did a great job uh, with that song. Uh, but God's not going to compare you uh, to the McCamies. Uh, God's not going to compare you uh, to the singing echoes. Uh, God's not going to compare you to some well-known group. But whatever God ability that God's given you, the only thing you got to do is just use whatever ability, whether you think you got five talents, two talents, or one one talent, you just get busy doing something for God and let him uh, do a work in your life. Uh, you might start out as nothing, uh, but when the Holy Ghost uh, uh, gets on you, uh, you'll become something uh, in the eyes uh, of Almighty God. Amen. So look, folks, that's nothing but an excuse. Well, I can't preach like certain preacher, or I can't sing like certain singer or I can't do this or that no but God didn't call you to be them he called them to be them he's calling you to be you man in this text and you just read it with me and I won't belabor the point but the Lord of the servant left out went to a far country uh, brother Greg uh, it said first uh, he delivered unto them uh, his goods uh, let me tell you right now uh, I'm glad God has delivered the goods to us uh, we got the Bible we got the Holy Ghost uh, we got the joy of the Lord we got salvation he's delivered delivered the goods 
He's ascended and he's in the glory world, but he's coming back. Whoa! We might not know the day or the hour, but he's coming. And like R.G. Lee, a preacher of a hundred years ago, said, Payday someday. Lord, have mercy. I'm here to tell you, don't look at the person with the five talents. And if you just got one, don't look at the fellow with just two. All you do is take what you got. It's between you and God. And go on and serve him. I want to debunk this theory. And man, it got on in the early service. Let me get started. Let's say that you think you don't have much to offer the Lord. Come on, hear me. Let's say this morning in your mind, you think you don't have much to offer the Lord. You need to remember number one. If God could use a stick, he can use you. Don't tell me you're dumber than a stick. Hey, Brother Tommy, let me borrow this. There was a man by the name of Moses. And Moses uh, was a st- 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 stutterer. And God called him and he st- 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 stuttered. God said, don't you worry about that. I'll take care of that. He said, but God, I had not got much to offer you. God said, Moses... What is that in your hand? And what happened was there was an old stick had fallen off a tree. And Moses got it and he used it for a walking stick. Moses had a few years under his belt and he used that thing, helped him get around. And God said, Moses, what's that thing in your hand? And Moses said, Lord, it's nothing but a stick. God said, give it to me. And God told him, said, don't you call it a stick anymore. From now on, it's going to be known as the rod of God. Let me tell you, with that old stick, with that rod, Moses lifted it up and turned the water into blood. With that old stick, he held it up over the Red Sea, and God opened up the Red Sea, and 600,000 Jews marched through on dry ground. Somebody say, Whoa! And listen, they got on over in uh, on their 40-year journey and they're in the desert uh, and they're about to starve to death of thirst. Uh, and God said, Moses, take the rod of God and strike that rock. Moses didn't say, but, 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 but God. He just obeyed God. He hit that rock and water started spewing out of the rock. If you tell me that you don't have anything you can offer for God, you're telling me you're dumber than a stick. Somebody say something. Let me give you some. Hey, these old Egyptians were wicked and ruthless people. And they chased Moses. You've heard me say it many times. i got to say it again. Chased them out on a peninsula, water to the left and to the right, and in front of Pharaoh and his army at the back. And God said, Moses, where's that rod? Moses said, right here, God. He said, use it, boy. Use it. Moses lifts that thing up and points it out over the Red Sea. About that time, the wind starts whirling. Uh, you ever seen uh, an elongated tornado? <laughs> Most of the time, they're up and down. That thing got sideways. It pushed the water up to the left. Uh, it pushed the water up to the right. It dried up the mud. Uh, honey, they didn't even get any mud on their feet. They walked through the midst uh, of the Red Sea on dry ground and God used a stick you heard me right a stick pop up our proof verses pop them up please 
And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he'll show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, ye shall see them again. No more forever the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Why are you crying to me? Speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod. That's that old stick. Now call the rod of God. But lift thou up thy rod. Stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground. Woo! Through the midst of the sea. God used a stick. And you say you can't serve God? I don't see any stick people in here this morning. You might have stick people on the back of your window, on your car. But pardon my English, you ain't a stick. And he brought victory. Let's see the rest of the story. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did with a stick upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. We get caught up in all this about having great ability, great finances, great resources. It doesn't matter what you have. If you don't give it to God, God cannot use it. The greatest stability is simply availability. I might not preach like Oliver Green. I might not preach like Mays Jackson. Some of those are my old heroes of the faith. But let me tell you, I just want to be what God given me because one day I'm going to be rewarded whatever amount of talent God gives me. And if you don't preach like me, that's all right. You just preach like whatever God gives you. You might not witness like I do. You might not sing like Steve or like the crafts. You might not play a piano like Miss Janet. That's all right. You take whatever talent, whatever ability God's given you and make it available to the Lord because... If God can use a stick, he can use you. When you think you don't have much to offer God, remember point number two. God used a rock to change the course of human history. Hey, let me tell you. I, some of y'all heard this, but I got to tell it anyway. There's a man named Abram and his wife Sarah. Later on, they're Abraham and Sarah. And God said, I'm going to bless your union. And through your union, you'll have children. And the whole world will be blessed because of it. But when man goes to messing with the will of God, it gets messed up every time. So they looked around, and Sarah was getting old. They said she's about past childbearing years. So they had a little servant, a little Egyptian woman. So I hate to tell it, but the truth's the truth. Abram goes to Hagar, and they have a child. And you got the Ishmaelites which are the Arabs, uh, which are the Palestinians, or the Philistines uh, of the Bible. Later on, uh, Sarah conceives. Uh, I want you to know God always keeps his promise. And now Sarah conceives. You got the Israelites and the Ishmaelites, and they've hated one another from that very day. So from the Ishmaelites come the Arabs, which are most of you terrorist world, 
on down to the Philistines of the Bible, and they're called Palestinians today. So one day, y'all still with me? So one day, the Philistines invade Israel. They said, we're going to kill the Jews. We're going to eliminate them off the face of the earth. Yeah, Hitler thought he would too. Somebody say amen. And let me tell you, they go out there, they invade Israel. And now the army of the Philistines are here. But wait a minute. Didn't I just say God used a rock, a rock to change the course of human history? Hold that thought on the battlefield. Let's go back to the house for a minute. Come on, let's go to the house. Over here at the house, here's Jesse. And Jesse calls his son, the youngest one, who wasn't even old enough to be in the military, so he's about 15 or 16 years old. He said, your brothers have been eating all that military food. And he said, I have fixed a crock pot full of speckled butter beans. <laughs> I cooked a head of cabbage. I've made some cornbread. I've sliced an onion. So you got to understand Hebrew to dig all that out. He said, he said, I want you to take them some good food from home. And the little old boy says, yes, sir. My father, you can depend on me. Little kid. Little kid goes down there, and you know this story anyway. Now the Philistines have a champion. Bible called him champion. He was a giant, and he's cursing God and cursing Israel. And little David, I've let his name out the bag. Little David said, who does that sorry rascal think he is to curse God like that? And big old tough brother in the Israeli Marine Corps says, Shh, you're going to get us killed. Hush, hush now. <laughs> David said, well, if you don't fight him, I will. Now, wait a minute. Their king was Saul. He was chosen for one reason. He's a head and shoulders taller than anybody in the country. So he should have been the one to fight this giant. I'm going somewhere with this. So little old David comes over and says, if you don't fight him, I will. He put his armor on David, and it hung on him like, a grand, like one of your grandchildren put your coat on and hang. He said, I can't fight like this. Here is a rock that came from the same place. Little David walked down to the brook. Little David picked him out five rocks. Let me tell you why. Goliath had four brothers. He said, I'm going to take the whole bunch out. That's what I need to do. Look here. See this little rock? This rock came from, it might have been lying right on top or right beside of the one that killed Goliath. This is an Israeli rock. One little rock. Don't tell me you're dumber than a rock. If you tell me you can't serve God, you're telling me you're dumber than a rock. So David got the rocks, and when we think of slingshot, we think of Dennis the Menace. With a Y. Oh, no. They had one of them you wind up in leather. Kind of make a helicopter out of that thing. Man, when David let it go, it was Holy Ghost guided. I mean, it was like laser precision. Bang! It pops old Goliath right in the head. He goes down for the count. One, two, three. He's dead. God used a rock. We think, I don't have great ability. I don't have great resources. I'm not like so-and-so. I don't have all these wonderful talents. God used a stick. 
and God used a rock. And you're saying you can't do something for God. Pop up our proof verses. We'll keep moving. <clears throat> and he took his staff in his hand, chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Hold it right there. Soon as you get ready to serve God, there'll be somebody standing on the sideline whining at you. They don't want to serve God, and you serving God makes them uncomfortable. These big brothers... They said, look at him. He's trying to put on a show. David said, is there not a cause? Pop up the next verse. Let's see the cause. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? He said, don't you go to whine at me because what I'm doing. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm just going to serve God. He said, is there not a cause? I'm here to tell you today, there's a cause that we're serving God. The world is going to hell head first. Very few people are doing anything for the glory of God. I'm here to tell you, there's a cause. But after the cause, uh, let's see the call. Oh, David called out to that giant. He called him out. He said, okay, big boy, you coming down here with a sword and a spear and a shield, but that's nothing. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Proof first. Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now let me show you how it all came out. Look at the next verse. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of the sheaf thereof, and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they took their tail between their legs like a scared puppy and they went to the house. Listen, God changed the whole course of human history with a rock. Don't tell me you don't have the ability or the resources or the talent. If God can use a stick and if God can use a rock, he can use you. Somebody say something. Hey, here's where I'm going with this. What if the Philistines had a won that day? What if David had not gone down there? And, and, if they, and the Philistines had whipped Israel. It might be that we wouldn't have a Savior today. That was what was all dependent on that one rock. So, it doesn't matter if you got five talents, two talent, one talent, or a half a talent. Availability is the greatest ability. Let's move on. Number three. If you don't think you got much to offer God, I want to remind you God used five biscuits and two brim to do the greatest miracle. See, Jesus had a camp meeting and out on the hillside. And listen to me, there are 5,000 men there. Now, ladies, I'm not trying to say anything negative, but he only counted the men. There could have been 5,000 women, too. That could have put the total crowd up about 10,000. And there were some children that might not eat much, but... Could have been 12, 15,000 people there. And Jesus said, all right, we finished with the morning session account meeting. Let's have lunch now. Somebody said, Lord, that's a long way to Burger King. The other one said, mm, McDonald's. I don't think I've seen one in Jericho or Jerusalem. 
And about that time, a little boy walked up. Listen, some of you folks that don't like a preaching service to get a little long, I got news for you. Jesus was long-winded. This little boy's mama packed him a lunch. He said, Mama, I'm going to camp meeting. I'm going to go hear Jesus pray. Oh, well, wait a minute. Come back here. We're going to fix you a lunch. He had five loaves and two little, they do look like brim. I've seen those fish. Brother Andy, I know's been, and some others of you. They call it St. Peter's fish. It looks just like a brim, and more than likely, that's what they had. And a little old boy walked up and said, Jesus, I'll share my lunch with everybody. 5,000 minimum, 10 or 12,000 possible, but minimum of 5,000. Jesus said, what you got there, young man? He said, I got five loaves and two brim. Jesus said, bring it here. We're talking about giving whatever little amount of thing we have to God. Every time Jesus broke the bread, it grew. Every time he cut that fish, it grew back. When the whole thing was said and done, everybody had sackets that wanted it. Minimum of 5,000, maybe 10 or 12. And Jesus said, hey, wait a minute. We're not going to be wasteful. Somebody gather up the fragments that remain. And Brother Greg, they had 12 bushel baskets of food left over from five loaves and two fish. Don't tell me you don't have what it takes to do something for God. If God can use a stick, and if God can use a rock, and if God can use a biscuit, and if God can use a fish, he can use you. Proof verses, pop them up, please. There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two, listen to this, small fish. They weren't even good-sized fish. They were small fish. Horny heads, maybe. But what are they among so many? Jesus said, make the men sit down. There was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes, listen, as much as they would. It was an all-you-can-eat supper, just like Swamp Guinea. All-you-can-eat. When they were filled, listen, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men which they had seen the miracle that Jesus did said, this is of a truth that a prophet should come into the world. Wait a minute. We think unless we have great resources, great talent, or great ability, doesn't matter if you got five talents, two talents, or one, in the end of this thing, Jesus, as long as they use it for him, he said the same thing to the man with two, with the man that had five. Well done, now good and faithful sir. You've been faithful over a few things. Come on, enter into the joy of the Lord. If God can use a stick, and a rock, and a biscuit, and a brim. And you going to tell me you can't do anything for God? Mm. Number four, if you ever think you don't have the right ability or a number of ability, I want to remind you that the Lord counts things in a different way than we do. We count five talents, two talents, one. We count the, the, all these things. God doesn't look at it like that. On one occasion, let me go ahead and spill it on out. There was a woman whose husband had died. She didn't have anything. She had the equivalent. She had two mites, M-I-T-E-S, 
Two mites are equivalent to a farthing in Hebrew money. A, a mite, M-I-T-E, listen to this, is one quarter, one fourth of one penny. So put two of them together, it is a half of one penny. This little widow went up and put the two mites in the treasure. And some of these big shots were over on the sideline with their chest stuck out. They probably gave $100, $50, whatever, I don't know. Jesus looked at them and said, what you got your chest stuck out for? He said, this little widow lady right here, she gave more than all y'all did. See, the Lord doesn't count things like, here's what, see, let's say the man had, uh, he gave 100. But let's say he had 150. Well, he still had 50 in his pocket. The man over here had 200 and gave 100. He still had 100 in his pocket. That poor little woman had two mites, one farthing. When she gave it, she had nothing else left. Lord said, it's not the amount, it's the attitude behind it. It's not the amount of ability or education or talent. It's the attitude you give it to the Holy Ghost and let God do it. I see this. we got to hurry along. Uh, we'll see this, Papa. And there came a poor a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples, said to them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. Half of a penny, but it was everything she had. So God didn't count it like half a penny, nickel, dime, quarter, dollar, $50, $100. He's not counting us like that either. You do the best you can. If God can use a stick and a rock and a biscuit and a brim and a half of a penny, surely he can use what we got for the glory of God. Hmm. I'm talking about serving God. We're talking about debunking excuses. People try to spiritualize their excuse. Well, I do it, but God is so worthy, and he is worthy. And I just don't have the kind of ability that I ought to have. Let me tell you something I found out. I've been doing this a while, and I've come across hundreds and hundreds of preachers. I preached in, a, and I don't want to sound bragging, a lot of churches besides ours. And let me tell you, these that think that they've got more degrees than a thermometer. Let me tell you, a young man start out fired up, and you better watch where you send him. Some of these seminaries are really cemeteries. They'll kill them. They'll have them standing up there. Hold your chin up. Stand with one foot. And, and hold your shoulders back. And whatever you do, don't ever sweat. <laughs> and don't leave the pulpit. Stand behind it and act as dignified as a department store mannequin. But then I've seen some old boys off the mill hill. Some old boys out the country. Some old boys that used to be on drugs and alcohol. Yet gloriously born into the family of God. They might not look like they're high and real credible. But boy, when the Holy Ghost is on them, they can get the job done for God. I'm here to tell you, God doesn't look at things and count things the way we do. And I got to squeeze this next one in because it's so, so important. If you feel like that you don't have a lot to offer God, remember this fifth point. The world didn't hold Jesus very high either. In the eyes of the world, Jesus didn't look like much. Listen, he's God. How many of you believe in the Trinity? God the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost. 
Jesus is God. But when he came, he was born into a poor family. He wasn't in the royal bloodline of the earth. And so when he goes into the ministry and starts preaching, some of them looked over here and they started throwing slurs at Jesus. Slur number one, is this not the carpenter's son? You're not in the bloodline. You're not a priest. Pop it up. There it is. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? That threw us. You don't have any business in the ministry. You're not of a royal descent. But he was. But wait a minute. It gets worse. A little bit later on after Jesus preached, he revealed to them that he was the Messiah. And one of them popped off. Who is this guy? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. They said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Pop it up. And Nathaniel said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, I am 100% military. But I won't tell you, everywhere there's a military base, there's hoochie-coochie shows and honky-tonks. But at Nazareth, it was off the chain bad. It wasn't just an Israeli military base. At Nazareth, there was a Roman military base. And the Romans were wicked as can be. So they said, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Folks, let me tell you, you can live holy wherever you're from if you want to. But they're not through with their slurs yet, Brother Wayne. Now they throw the worst one at him. Jesus is preaching about living holy. And they looked at him and said, you don't have any business telling us about living holy. And they looked at them and stuck their shoulders back and their nose in there. And they looked right at Jesus and said, we be not born of fornication. Trying to throw a slight on the virgin birth. This is in the Bible. Pop up the next verse. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then, they, then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We are one father, even God. Jesus didn't rank real high in the eyes of the world. But yet he's God. He's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He's the Messiah. He's the King. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the first. He's the last. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. And he's our soon coming King. The world didn't look at him as much, but we know who he was. So when the world tries to throw a slight your way, don't give it a thought. Just serve God anyway. Doesn't matter if you got five talents or you got two talents. You got one talent. I'm going to say this, and I mean no disrespect to the memory of the man I'm about to mention. One of these days, some of these, and, and I love good singing as much as you do. One day, they might be calling the Gaithers down to the throne of God. And the Gaithers, with their perfect singing, and I mean, it's good. I'm not saying anything bad about it. And they're going to be rewarded because God's given most of them like five talents. He might finish with Bill Gaither. Say, Brother Mac. You next, buddy. Now, if you remember Brother Mac, he's been in heaven quite a while. I've never known anybody that had a better spirit about them than Brother Mac. 
He knew he knew he wasn't in their league. He'd get up and say, I've had a request, but I'm going to sing anyway. <laughs> He'd say it. And he might run ahead of the music and back up, but that old boy loved God. My wife, well, she's not in here right now. She was a few minutes ago. Guess took one of the young ones out. But we went out to hospice to see old brother Mac. I saw him every day. My wife didn't see him often. She went out there with me one Saturday. She said, Brother Mac, you don't look like you need to be here. You need to be singing. He said, what you want me to sing? <laughs> Just like that. And lying. <laughs> lying there in that bed at the hospice. He cut loose. You could hear him up the hall at the desk singing when all of his being for the Lord. You know, Bible said down here, some that we think are first are going to be last. Some we think are last are going to be first. Old Brother Mac, he probably didn't have five talents or four or three. Might not have had two. But I'm going to tell you, he might be rewarded more than some of these other singers on the other side because he was doing it out of his heart for the love of the Lord. It was not a performance. It was worship. It was worship. Some little country preacher might be rewarded more. I loved old brother Mays Jackson. If I ever had respect for a preacher, boy, I love brother Mays. He was my kind of preacher. There might be some little old country preacher somewhere in eternity might be rewarded more than old brother Mays maybe. Because he's been faithful with what little he had, he used it for God. But what's true of singers and preachers is also true of all of us. Don't think just because you don't have some great ability that you can't do something for God. I'm going to say it again and I'm finished. The greatest ability. It's not to reach every note with perfection and singing. The greatest ability is not to preach and never butcher the English language or not say something that's grammatically correct. The greatest ability is availability. You make available to God whatever he's given you. You let the Holy Ghost in it. Everything's going to be all right. One of these days, we'll be back at the house. And we'll be with the Lord. And it'll be worth every mile of the trip. Let's pray. Our Father God, I thank you today for the privilege that you've given us. Lord, let us never look at things the way the world looks at it. Lord, the widow with the two mites gave more than the rich people. And Lord, they throwed slurs at you. You didn't have the highest of honor from people of the world. Help us, God, in Jesus' name. To not worry about accolades, not worry about what people may think, but use whatever talent, big or little, that we use it for you. Help us, God, today we pray. I realize, God, it really wasn't an evangelistic message, but that one that might be here not saved, send them to an old-fashioned altar, as we had that young lady at the early service. Touch our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name. All right, let's sing, folks.
We hope you have enjoyed this week's broadcast of Gethsemane Baptist Temple, the voice of Calvary. We invite you to join us here each week. Or better yet, join us on Sunday at 6116 Highway 81 South in Star, South Carolina. For more information, visit us online at www.gbtemple.com. We look forward to seeing you in church Sunday.